Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, Megalodon just keeps on getting bigger, scientists have made woolly mice in an effort to recreate woolly mammoths, the world's oldest asteroid impact crater has been discovered, and much more. Remember to check out our mildly chaotic unboxing of the Spring Curiosity Box from last week's video on the Dragon from Hell to see Doug, Amelia and myself unboxing some fabulous scientific goodies. I tried to keep the ball rolling while Doug played with marbles and Amelia forgot where she was from. This is still, this is aluminum. Zinc, brass, aluminum and steel. Okay, and this, is, this is zinc oh, or... No, it's aluminium, it's not aluminum, it's yeah, aluminium. It? Okay, just having an argument with yourself. With <laughs> Use our super special affiliate link below to grab some of these goodies for yourself and our unique promo code BEN25 for 25% off. Our top story this week is the publication of a new study that has reassessed the possible size of the infamous giant prehistoric shark, Megalodon. The big fish of death, scientifically known as Otodus Megalodon, has undergone many different interpretations of its potential maximum length and mass over the years. Most recent estimates of the shark's body length had generally been putting it at between 15 to 20 meters, or about 49 to 65 and a half feet. These estimates were calculated based on comparisons made with the body proportions of various living shark species, such as the great white. However, in January of 2024, a team of paleontologists then published a paper showing that we had in fact probably been underestimating the length of the murder guppy. This is because, based on a fossilized vertebral column belonging to Megalodon, it looks like the shark actually had quite different body proportions compared to modern white sharks, being much more slender and therefore having an overall longer body. They didn't give specific length estimates in this paper, but now, in this new research by a team comprising many of the same scientists, they calculate a possible body length for Megalodon of 24.3 meters, or 79.7 feet. This value was calculated using a new method of size estimation that hasn't been applied to the shark before, and it's one that doesn't assume the modern great white is an analogue for megalodon body shape. The 24.3 meter length was specifically estimated for a particularly large individual represented by an absolutely massive vertebra uncovered in Denmark. But hypothetically, they could still have grown larger. A length of 16.4 meters in total body length was also estimated for the vertebral column fossil I mentioned previously. This research also added further evidence supporting the idea that Megalodon could have been a particularly slender shark, as they show that in order to remain hydrodynamically efficient at such large body sizes, a slender body form would be better than a body that's just a scaled up great white. Another rather astonishing result of this study is that the researchers find the size of Megalodon at birth to have been somewhere between 3.6 and 3.9 meters. So they potentially gave birth to the largest babies in the whole evolutionary history of fishes. This also supports the idea that Megalodon was ovoviviparous, meaning the eggs hatched within the body of the parent and the embryos grew inside their mothers for a while. They also probably would have cannibalized the other eggs inside their mothers in order to grow to this size at birth, a tactic that a few modern species of sharks also employ. The study analyzes the cruising speed of Megalodon too, finding them to be no faster than a great white, and discusses the rise of the great white and the role they might have played in the extinction of Megalodon. Lots of really interesting stuff in this paper then. We do love to see a prehistoric animal get a good size upgrade. Also in the paleontology news this week, we've got a new species of dinosaur in town. It's a new kind of titanosaurian sauropod that lived about 78 million years ago in Argentina. It's been named Chaddy Titan Calvawai, coming from the words Chaddy, meaning salt in the language of the Mapuche people of Argentina. It's also named after Argentine paleontologist Jorge Calvo, who sadly passed away in 2023. Chaddy Titan is known from several partial skeletons that together preserve much of the limbs and some of the backbone, and it actually would have been rather small for a titanosaur with an estimated length of 7 meters, or about 23 feet. It belongs to a subgrouping of titanosaurs called Rincansauria. Members of this group are all quite slender, lightly built, and relatively small, with an overall body shape different to other titanosaurs. The bones of Chaddy Titan were uncovered from a newly recognized locality in Argentina on a family farm, which has also yielded various other fossil discoveries, all described in the same paper, such as many different kinds of fishes, 
land snails, and an unusually high abundance of turtles. In fact, more than 90% of the recovered fossils were of freshwater turtles. So it's a fantastic new dinosaur and a very exciting new fossil locality. In other news, the oldest meteorite crater yet found on Earth has been discovered in Australia, and it's a whopping 1 billion years older than the previous oldest. There's a somewhat suspicious absence of impact craters from this early on in Earth's history. We know that planetary bombardment was going on at this time in the solar system, as we can see evidence for this from craters on the Moon. But Earth's surface has been constantly changed and recycled over billions of years, so evidence of such craters this early on in Earth's history would be more difficult to find. Researchers in Australia discovered the now second oldest impact crater back at the beginning of 2020, which, as a fun side note, we reported on in our 100th episode of Seven Days of Science. This crater was aged at 2.2 billion years old, but the one in the study published this week is 3.47 billion years old, which is a massive geological difference. It wasn't a small impact either. The meteorite would have impacted onto the planet at over 22,000 miles an hour, and created a crater over 100 kilometers wide. This would have had a fairly significant impact on the planet, and there are even ideas that it could have helped foster early microbial life, and perhaps had a hand in the formation of early continents. Also in the recent news, the US biotech company Colossal, which is aiming to resurrect the woolly mammoth and other extinct animals, announced that it has produced woolly mice. This is said to be the first step in the process of resurrecting the mammoth, as the scientists working at the company genetically modified these mice as a way to test their methods of editing several genes at once, before these techniques are then applied to Asian elephants, the closest living relatives of woolly mammoths. The results of these tests are some rather adorable shaggy-haired mice, which have some genes that resemble those of mammoths. And so the team has now confirmed that the genes suspected to be responsible for these traits in mammoths do indeed produce the desired features. However, some scientists have voiced their doubts over the importance of these results, stating that they are just mice with some special genes, and that this is far away from making a mammoth or a mammoth mouse. Colossal has stated that they are aiming to have their first mammoths born by 2028, so it will be interesting to see if they are able to achieve this. In some more mice news, weirdly enough, we have a story from a paper published a few weeks ago. Researchers observed the behavior of conscious mice around unconscious mice and found that they exhibit behaviors similar to instinctive first aid behaviors shown by humans. Upon seeing an unconscious social partner made unconscious by the researchers using anesthesia, the conscious mouse would show consistent behaviors towards the mouse in need, from sniffing and grooming to biting and even pulling on the tongue of the unconscious mouse. The researchers observed that certain parts of the brain of the mouse were activated in order to trigger this behavior. Fascinatingly, what the conscious mouse was doing to the unconscious mouse was found to accelerate the recovery from unconsciousness, showing not only a repeated pattern of behaviors to the scenario of a mouse in need, but that these behaviors are actually effective. While there have been numerous observations of complex social behavior in mammals, this is the first time that first responder-like behavior has been observed in mice. In addition, this is the first study to show that oxytocin, often called the love hormone, could be a key factor in the social bonding of mice. In other news, researchers have discovered that birds' nests built in cities can act sort of like a geological record, as plastics used in the building of the nests are able to be dated. Scientists in the Netherlands analyzed various nests built by common coots, a small wetland bird, in the city center of Amsterdam. Many of these incorporated bits of plastic in between the twigs, and the researchers soon realized that some of them were recording bits of recent human history. One of these nests contained more than 600 pieces of plastic and showed a distinctive COVID layer containing about 15 face masks from the pandemic. At the base of the nest, they also discovered a Mars bar wrapper advertising the 1994 FIFA World Cup, meaning this nest must have been built over 30 years ago. The nest had probably been inhabited by at least three generations of coots and seems to have been more durable due to the plastic being incorporated, as coots will usually make a new nest each year. However, the reuse of this old nest may also indicate a struggle to find new nesting sites, and there's also the danger of the birds becoming entangled in the plastic waste. It's a very interesting study and undoubtedly a fascinating discovery that bird nests can be used to document the history of the Anthropocene in this way. Finally for the news this week, scientists have discovered another reason that whales are so important for the oceans. It has been known for some time that baleen whales, when they feed at depth, move tons of nutrients from deep water levels to the surface, 
as they excrete waste in shallower waters. But research published this week in Nature reveals that they also transfer nutrients horizontally, thousands of miles across whole ocean basins in their urine. In the summer, adult whales feed at high latitudes, such as Antarctica and Alaska, in rich cold waters that contain vast amounts of krill and herring, enabling them to put on tons of much-needed fat. Then, as winter approaches, they migrate to warm waters near the equator to give birth and mate. The area of the calving grounds tends to be smaller than the summer feeding grounds, as the whales aggregate, and so the released nutrients and biomass are concentrated in these areas. The study shows that migrating grey, humpback, and right whales convey almost 4,000 tonnes of nitrogen and over 46,000 tonnes of biomass per year to their calving grounds in the form of urine, although sloughed skin, carcasses of dead adults and calves, calf feces, and placentas also contribute. The addition of nutrients to these waters potentially plays an essential role in the carbon cycle and other biogeochemical processes in these comparatively nutrient-poor tropical waters. This contribution could even have been as much as three times higher before commercial whaling, highlighting the importance of protecting these great whales. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. You can follow Seven Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Clara Middleton, Drew Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, John French, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Pietrzyka Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Voss, Staniforth Hopkins, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.